Krishna Hare Krishna Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare Hare you can hear me, Gaurapriya? Yes, Gurudev, I can hear you. I feel that the Philip's sound is disactivated. So maybe he's having problem. But, but yes, we can hear you. Okay. Hare Rama, Hare Rama. Nama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. He has muted us. Oh, okay. We're in the temple now. And I'm going to pin. Can we pin the temple so we can see everybody? Because I think, yeah. Is that possible? Or we can see myself in the temple? You know how to do that, Gora Priya? What Guru did? We can enlarge, we can pin myself in the temple. Is that possible? Temple room, Krishna village, here it says Krishna village. Yeah, Krishna village and you are pinned. Oh, that's why I can't pin them. Okay, yeah, now I see it. All right, good. So, Nicholas, what's the program? Are we doing just the initiation now or the fire sacrifice as well? Uh, the fire sacrifice is later today. Okay. So uh, uh, class, class and initiation this morning. Okay. It's nice to see all of you. I feel, I feel like I'm back in New Govardhan. Hare Krishna. Namo Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Shami Tinamani Namaste Sarashati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvisesa Sanyavari Prasthaya Is it possible you can do Achman? You have a... And um, also that someone... Um, you can do Achman um, and then someone can, some uh, senior devotee can put neck beads on you while I'm speaking. Namo Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Shami Tinamane Namaste Sarashati Deve Gauravani Pacharine Nirvisesa Sanyavari Pashchati Dasatarine. So we're going to, we're going to do two things at once today. We're going to do an initiation. We're also going to talk about Lord Nishingadev. And there's some things we normally do during initiation, so we'll, maybe we'll do those first. Um, what time should I stop speaking? How long is we, uh, It's a fasting day, so it's all too long. Okay. We go all day, right? Okay. Yeah, let's, let's do it. Um, So when we when we take Achman at initiation, we chant a verse Om Apavitra, Pavitrava, whether one is pure or impure. 
sarvavastan kutopiva, um, whether whatever one has done, um, wherever he's been, sarvavayantara suchihi, he becomes purified by remembering Krishna. Om apavito pavito va sarvavastam kutopiva, yat smarane pundarigaksham sarvavayantara suchihi. One becomes purified by remembering the lotus side. So the reason, there's two reasons this verse is chanted. One reason is this is a purification, purification ceremony, initiation. It's like what we call rites of passage. In Sanskrit, it's called samskar. And the other reason or an additional reason is to help us understand that anyone, no matter where they've come from, can be purified by a spiritual process. And the spiritual process means we're coming in touch with Krishna or God, who is all pure. So naturally, when you come in touch with something pure, you become pure, just like the sun dispels the darkness. So no matter how dark you are and how dark your past has been, when you come in front of the sun, you become light. So that's why we chant this verse. And at, at first initiation, it is called Harinam. Harinam means a holy name. It is initiation in which the disciple, aspiring disciple, makes a promise that they will chant 16 rounds and follow four regular principles. And the four principles are followed in order to create a foundation upon which the chanting can be pure. And so, what Prabhupada did at, at first initiation was he would talk about the offenses to the holy name. He wanted us to discuss the offenses because this is a ceremony in which one is now vowing to chant. And chanting is a purif purification, purificatory process, but it has it is limited if one doesn't chant properly. So that's why during the initiation, it, it is discussed how to chant properly. And the, um, the first thing I want to say is that sometimes uh, one may misunderstand that, that because the chanting of the holy names is pure, it's always powerful. It will always be powerful. The sun at 11 o'clock or three o'clock, it's still strong, especially in the summer. But the example that is given is if we're not chanting purely, it's like clouds covering the sun. So although the sun is always strong and hot, but when the clouds cover it, then it's effulgence, it's light is weakened and it's heat is weakened. So in the same way, the sun of the holy name can be weakened when we chant improperly. And in Sanskrit, the, the, the mistakes we make or the improper execution of chanting is called, generally it's called aparad. And uh, we translate that as, an off as offense, but aparad actually means to become distant from worship. And it also means aparad, radha is a name of course of Krishna's consort. And Radha is the greatest worshiper. So it also means to be distanced from the mercy of Radha, Krishna's merciful side. And, and so Srila Prabhupada wanted us to take, take our chanting seriously. And he said many times that if you chant 16 rounds of all these principles, you can become completely purified in this life you can actually develop love for God and this could be your last life in the material world. So when somebody takes initiation, really, really they're aside from the vows they're taking, they're really making an internal commitment to make this my last life in the material world, to, to take, take my vows seriously enough that the holy name purifies me completely. And so that's, that's, you know, some people wonder why would you take initiation or when are you ready for initiation? You're ready when you want to make this, you want to take to the process of Krishna consciousness. 
with all seriousness. In other words, you want to make it a priority in your life. It's not that you won't do other things, but this, this priority will always be there. This 16 rounds will always be there. The following of the regulative principles will always be there. And so when one wants to do that, then they make a public commitment. So Nicholas, Nick is going to make a public commitment today to chant, and you're all going to hear it. And so if he doesn't do it, you can go beat him up on my behalf. Okay, it's authorized. <laughs> so um, that's part of the power of making a public vow, that it's not that just he's making a vow to a spiritual master, but you're all hearing the vow. So in that sense, he's making it to you. He's making it in front of the deities, in front of the Murti of Srila Prabhupada. Prabhupada is here, so he's making it to Srila Prabhupada. So initiation means you, you want to take what's inside of you, what you've been following, and you want to make it official. And, and the reason that we take vows is because we want to not just follow something that we want to follow, but we want to commit our life to doing it. And that's why we make a vow. And that's what initiation is about. Because one could chant and follow without taking the vow. But the vow is the next step. Right? The vow is taken because this is what I want to do. And to ensure that I, I will always do it, I want to take a vow. Because once we take a vow, the idea is I can't go back. Before we take a vow, we can say, this is nice. I'd like to do it. We can always go back. So the idea of taking a vow is to always go forward. So that's what initiation means. And I heard something today that I've never heard before that might twist your head, spin your head a little bit. And it involves the first offense, which is to criticize or blaspheme the devotees of the Lord who have dedicated themselves for giving Krishna consciousness to others. Srila Prabhupada said, wherever there's two people, there will be two opinions. You've probably noticed that, right? We all have opinions about everything. Even we're reading the same book, we have two opinions about the same thing, isn't it? The elephant, you know, the blind man and the elephant. We think well, there's six different, the elephant is six different things. And so often uh, devotees would argue uh, and it would be very upsetting to Prabhupada because he's teaching us to be respectful, to be humble, to cooperate. These are, these are qualities of a devotee. So very upsetting. So listen to what Prabhupada said. This is amazing. He said, I am more upset when you fight amongst one another than if you broke the regulative principles. I am more upset when you're fighting than I am when you're breaking or if you were breaking the regulative principles. Isn't that amazing? So that first offense is, you could say, the foundation of what Prabhupada's saying. It's, it's the criticism. Why is that a problem? It's a problem because if you're trying to become dear to someone, if you're trying not to offend someone, if you're trying to get closer to someone, in this case, that someone is Krishna, by chanting his name, you don't want to do anything which would upset him, right? You know, you're trying to become friends with somebody. You don't want to upset people that they like. You know, if they like this politician and you want to be friends with someone, don't talk about that politician in negative terms because it's going to upset them, right? Don't, don't speak negative about their parents. Don't speak negative, negative about the people they like, the things they like. The devotee of Krishna is most dear to Krishna. So when we speak negatively about a devotee, that hurts Krishna. And so it's a, it's a paradox that I'm chanting the name of Krishna, so-called praying to him. At the same time, I'm doing things which hurt him. So then it neutralizes the effect. And then our chanting does not have the power. It's, every offense we make compromises the power 
It's kind of like watering down, watering down our chanting with every offense. So of, of the 10 offenses, there's just a few that are common for us who are raised in the West, who are not born as Hindus. And I wanna focus on those because that way we, we can spend more time speaking about that which is important. And then we would try to tie this in to the pastimes of Lord Nishingadev. So dis, disrespecting the spiritual master's orders, minimizing his orders, is, it's kind of the same consciousness with which we may criticize someone or put someone down. And the idea of, of, of practicing spiritual life, Trinadapi Sunichina, we, we're trying to practice humility. So Krishna sends us a spiritual master so we can practice humility because most of us were not, were not as humble as we need to be to, to go forward in our spiritual life. So Krishna says, well, here's a person, you can serve them. He's my representative. You can follow them. You can practice humility with him. So to disrespect means you kind of cut yourself off from that person who Krishna sent you to serve and cut yourself off from the guidance that person can give you. Because disrespect also means to lose faith. And so the principle of, of a spiritual master primarily is a guide who has been on the path that you're gonna go on, but you don't exactly know how to traverse that path, what streets to take, where, where to turn and so forth. He's already been there. He takes you by the hand and he guides you. If you disrespect that advice and say, well, I don't know if what you're saying is really true. Then you cut yourself off from the help that you need because the path of spiritual purification, we can't do it on our own. If we could do it on our own, we would have already done it. You know, a lot of people say, why can't I do it on my own? You had a lot of lives to do it on your own. Um, it's obvious that we need help. Otherwise, after all those lives, we would have figured it out. So, um, Bhaktivinoda Thakur has written a book called Harinam Chintamani, which is a, kind of a treatise on what is chanting, what is the holy name, and how to chant. And he says something interesting um, in the offense, which is described as, don't be too materially attached and don't be inattentive. That's the 10th offense. And um, have have faith, it's offense not to have faith in, in chanting, in the process and so forth. So these are interesting, these are interesting. Uh, when, when you come to the spiritual path, the first thing you learn is you're not the body, right? Aham Brahmasmi, I'm not the body, we, that's what we learn. I'm not a man, I'm not a woman, I'm not an Aussie, I'm not an American, I'm not white black, man, woman, young, old. If we want to progress on the, on the path, then no. if- there, I'm just sending you a link. I'm, on, I'm watching it now on the computer. It's live at the temple of Mahatma. Can you turn off your mic, please? Thank you. Yeah. So um, if we want to advance on, on the spiritual path, there, attachment, we're naturally attached to so many things. So attachment is natural, but too much attachment becomes a problem because whatever we're most attached to is where our mind goes. And if we're too attached to things, material things, that's where our mind goes. So it's considered an offense, therefore, that as you elevate yourself through the process, what happens is you naturally become detached. But sometimes, you don't allow that natural attachment to continue to pull back a little bit. Uh, I don't want to give that up. Krishna's, Krishna's kind of helping you let go of something and then you kind of grab onto it. I, I, stayed, I stayed too much identified with my body. This is who I am, that identity. If we're too attached 
or to that identity too closely involved with it. That's that offense of maintaining material attachment. It really means identifying with the body. And then not having faith in chanting means something like, I don't think I can become pure by this chanting. I don't think it'll work. I've, I've done too many sinful things. I've too many, done too many bad things. It's not going to work on me. It'll work on anybody. It's you or anybody. It doesn't matter. But it doesn't work when you don't think it's going to work. When you, when you lack that faith that it's going to work, then it doesn't work. So that offense to not have complete faith. No, it does work. This can purify you to the highest level. This can give you love of Krishna. This can take you back to Krishna. That faith is necessary. And that, that's also philosophical, a philosophical conclusion, faith in the philosophy. But it's also practical because sometimes devotees think, I, I'm, I've done so many bad things. I'm too fallen. I'm too low. It's not going to work. And that's not a fact. Don't ever think that way. Sometimes we think that way. It's more of a psychological problem. It's not a spiritual problem at all, because it will work. So we shouldn't get, we shouldn't get this idea in our head that I'm uh, too fallen or unworthy or whatever. And then the and the last one or the most important one is inattention. And Bhaktivinoda Thakur says inattention is the cause of the other offenses, which is. It's kind of interesting statement. How could one thing cause everything else? So let me explain how that can happen. We gave the example of the sun and the clouds. So inattention means I'm sitting with my mantra, but I'm not paying attention to my mantra. I'm paying attention to the thoughts in my mind. In my conditioned state, the thoughts in my mind that I'm paying attention to are usually my problems and my to-do list. And I can completely, I can completely disconnect from my chanting. I could disconnect so much by not being present to my mantra that I'm so present to my physical body, my mind and its disturbances, my anxieties, my worries, my to-do list, and so forth, that my chanting is hardly purifying me. It's hardly working, so to speak. And therefore I'm chanting every day, but the power of the holy name, I'm only realizing a little because I'm not present to it. It's not that I can chant haphazardly and it's gonna work. So then because of the inattention, I'm basically, Krishna's coming to me and I'm neglecting him. That's pretty bad. We've done that for millions of lifetimes. So we've neglected Krishna for millions of lifetimes. How bad is it now to neglect him while I'm chanting his name? That's kind of like the icing on the cake of paradox, isn't it? I've been competing with Krishna and neglecting him. Now I'm chanting and I'm thinking of something. I'm still neglecting him. And if I do that, then the efficacy of the holy name will not be very strong. And in that weak state, what will I do? I will criticize devotees. I will doubt the holy name. I will doubt my spiritual master. I'll make all the other offenses. I may um, break the principles like that. Does that make sense? So that's why um, attention is so important. And I, I'll just say one more thing about attention and then we'll begin speaking a little bit about Lord Nishingadev. Recently, I was in Vrindavan and I was asked to give a Japa workshop. And a few days before, I had a thought. It was an interesting thought. I've, I've had this thought before, but I never really articulated it or dwelled on it like I did. And it kind of expanded in my mind. So I was thinking, I've been chanting for 52 years. And, and often when I chant for part of my rounds, I will walk. And so sometimes I think, oh, okay, Krishna and I are now going for a walk. We, goes, we go on walks almost every day together. So Krishna in the form of his name, we're going on a walk. So what Krishna is that? What form of Krishna is that? Whose Krishna is that? So we know from Ras Lila that every gopi had their own Krishna when Mahaprabhu was 
chanting at Rath Yatra, he was in he was with all the seven kirtan parties they all thought he was only with them when krishna with, was with his friends the coward boys they all thought he's only looking at me he's my krishna so i began thinking when we're chanting whose krishna is that it's your krishna it's my krishna we each have our own krishna that appears when we chant right so then I was, uh, I was telling the students, the participants in the course, so now your Krishna is showing up. So what are you gonna do? Are you gonna give him attention or are you gonna neglect him? Interesting question, right? Krishna, this is my Krishna. You have your Krishna, I have my Krishna. He has her, his Krishna. She has her Krishna. Diana has her Krishna. Nick has his Krishna. Radha has her Krishna. Krishna Das has his Krishna, and I have my Krishna, and every devotee in Iskand has their own Krishna. So when you begin chanting, your Krishna appears, what are you gonna do now? Are you gonna neglect that Krishna or pay attention? And then we took it further and said, actually your Krishna is appearing to be worshiped. Just like you worship deities, you can worship the holy name. Your Krishna appears, what should you be doing? You should be worshiping and praying, right? Not doing anything else. So it's a nice meditation. And that's how we, we can give attention to the name by thinking my Krishna is showing up, I need to give attention. Uh, and I need to give my heart to him through the Maha Mantra. That's how I chant, I give my heart. So that's a little summary of the six hour workshop you just got in about 20 minutes. Real time saver for you. So that's the basis. So. It's Lord Nishinga Dave's appearance day for you today? Yes. Is that correct, yeah. So for us, it's, for us now it is, uh, here it is almost 6.15. So I think for you it's 8.15, is that correct? In the morning? Yes. Yes, yes. And so for us it is uh, Saturday night. Today is Lord Nishinga Dave's appearance day. We're fasting. And, um, What, what is the position of Lord Nishingadev in Gaudiya Vaishnavism? What is, what is his position in our life? How do we relate to him? Why did he come in that form? What is the whole idea? You can answer this question in many ways, but I want to specifically focus on who is Lord Nishingadev for us. We know the story of Lord Nishingadev. Um, the he came to protect his devotee from a father who was trying to kill him and destroy him. And we know that when one becomes a devotee, Krishna protects him. And in order to protect him, he needed to kill his father because if he didn't kill his father, his father would perpetually try to kill Prahlad. He would perpetually try to kill him. And he was terrifying the universe causing so many problems. And it was necessary that he be killed. Uh, sacrifice, they say sacrifice one person to save a village. In this case, sacrifice one person to save a universe. He was disrupting the universe. So Srila Prabhupada said that he actually did not come to kill Haranyakashibu. He came to bless Prahlad out of affection. So although he came and was angry. The, the inner mood and emotion of Lord Nishingadev was blessing. So he is God in a form which not only protects his devotee, but more importantly, blesses his devotee. And the blessings that he'll, he will give us will also depend on the blessings we ask from him. So Often when we think of Lord Nishingadev, we think of Lord Nishingadev as the protector of the body. If you chant Nishinga Kabacha, it's prayers of please protect my head, my throat, my thighs, my stomach, and like that. And when we are in danger, we go to Lord Nishingadev because it's that aspect of God or Krishna in the mood of protector. And there are many stories like this in which devotees were in danger and they chanted the name of Lord Nishingadev, and the people who were causing trouble 
became afraid or they left or situations changed. And so, so definitely there is this Lord Nishringadeva as the protector of the body, as he protected Prahlad's body, because Prahlad could not be killed. So who was protecting him? He should have been, he was, his father attempted, I think, eight times, actually more than eight, only, I think there's eight primary ways, but if you study a little more, you see his father kept going and going, other times also. And so every time he was protected by Nishringadeva. So we have, we have this physical protection. It's kind of in the front of our mind. When you think of the pastime, you think physical protection. Prahlad was protected. But for us as bhaktas, there's a, there's a greater protection, which is protecting us from giving in to our own weaknesses. That's the real protection that he gives us and the real protection that we need. So sometimes we, we, we say that Lord Nishingadev killed Hiranyakashipu, but we would like Lord Nishingadev to kill our materialistic tendencies, our material desires. We would like him to kill those things which separate us from him. So what, whatever you're challenged with, whatever difficulty you have, whether it's external or internal, as devotees of Krishna, the Shringadev is that personality whom we can pray to. And, and some devotees say, well, can't I pray to Krishna? Can't I pray to Guru? That, that is there, of course. But specifically, in order to Shringadev, in this ferocious form, will ferociously remove those obstacles within us that are blocking us on the path. So today on Lord Nishringadev's appearance day, this is really what we're asking Nishringadev to do. Destroy my material desires, destroy my envy, destroy my greed, destroy my lust, change my mind so that, that I can, I, I no longer have the tendency towards these things. And he reciprocates with your prayers. So, so in, in, in this way, in this way, we, we cherish our relationship with Lord Nishingadev because he's that person who has the power to, to remove all the contamination within our heart. And when, when I think of protection, I think the biggest protection that we need, we require, is to be protected from our own tendencies to turn our back on Krishna. And those are, those are long-held habits, long-held conditioning, long-held proclivities to turn our back on Krishna. We're always tending to do that. Whenever we see something that we think is enjoyable, we will tend to think about enjoying it and tend to forget about Krishna as the provider of those things and ultimately the one who should be served by those things. So that tendency to turn away, to turn our back on Krishna, as we all know, it creeps up on us. It's, it's why we're here in this world and unless we overcome it, we're not going to get out. So that's really, that's, that in my mind, my heart, that's the essential prayer to Lord Nishimhade. Please protect, protect me from my own proclivity to turn my back on you. And therefore clean out all those things within me that would cause you, cause me to turn my back on you. Please protect me from myself because I am my worst enemy. And he will do that. In the, in the past times of Lord Nishingadev, I want to draw your attention to Prahlad Maharaj because so much of this story focuses on the saintly character of Prahlad Maharaj. And Prahlad Maharaj's character is so inspiring. I also want to point out that the story, of course, focuses on the 
the demoniac qualities of his father, Hiranyakashipu, who, as, as we see in the world with despotic, narcissistic dictators, to serve their own purposes, they will kill people. They will cause great suffering to others. If it, if it in any way moves them forward to their goals. We've seen this throughout history. We don't, we can't fathom that people would be so bad to do that, but they do it. Hiranyakasipu was like that a thousand times over. So much so that he dared to kill his son, which is even, even the worst, I'm not a historian, but as far as I know, even the worst rulers didn't kill their own family. Oh, maybe sometimes. Actually, a few did. Uh, in India, at least I know a story. But anyway, it's, let's just say it's uncommon. It's not normal. And so what I would, would also ask you to do as you're studying the character of Prahlad Maharaj, study the character of Hiranyakashipu and ask yourself a question. Do I have any minute trace of the same qualities and tendencies he has? So it's kind of a self-reflective exercise to look at Hiranyakashipu and ask yourself, in what way do I reflect some of those qualities? Because normally, when we look at Hiranyakashipu, we think he, he is one of the most demoniac, horrible, sinful, evil people that have ever lived. And, and by making that statement, we just kind of write off any possibility that any of, of what he is, I may have some of those tendencies. But the fact is, we do. And so when we read the story about Hiranyakashipu, when we hear about him, we should reflect, in, in any way, am I like that? And you might be surprised to find, oh, well, actually, I'm, uh, I'm more like that than I thought. And so then, and then we look at Prahlad Maharaj and Prahlad Maharaj is exactly the opposite of his father. And we see the qualities of Prahlad Maharaj, qualities we could not possess at this point in our life, maybe never, qualities we certainly cannot imitate or fake. So how do we look at Prahlad Maharaj we ask ourselves the question, how could I be a little bit more like him? Because if I ask the question, how can I be like him? The answer will be, I can't. Uh, and then we may get discouraged. Well, I can't be like him. This is discouraging. I'm hearing about his qualities and it makes me feel worse because he's so pure and I'm so impure. Have you ever felt like that before? When you hear, um, about the life and activities of very elevated devotees. Have you ever felt like, oh, this is impossible. This is discouraging. I'm supposed to be like him. So it's better to think, how could I be a little bit more like him right now? Not like I have to be exactly like him. How could I be a little bit more like him? And if you study the character of Prahlad Maharaj, one thing is gonna stand out and we all need to be more like this. He is never reacting to his father's anger with anger. He's never reacting to his father's insults with more insults. He's never reacting to his father's revenge with more revenge. He's actually responding to his father's hatred towards him with kindness towards his father, with compassion, with a, desire, with a desire to help his father. Hmm. I think I'm getting prasadam delivered here to my door. I can hear. Because I won't be able to go back to the temple. And this, it's dusk now, right? I guess I better end the, the class soon and you know, get this over with and take prasadam. Yeah. Hold on a second. <laughs> yeah. To come to class, we, can. <laughs> we have four guests coming to the initiation from the lateral. They're delivering prasadam and delivering their.
bodies at the same time in my room. So, um, Prahlad Maharaj is such an inspiration because what we learn from him is that no matter how ill-treated he was, his compassion for his father, his desire to help his father, it never waned no matter what his father did. Isn't that amazing? Like how many people are like that who can be compassionate in the face of people mistreating them, what to speak of killing them? So this is the kind of inspiration we we want to, this is an aspect of Prahlad Maharaj we want to meditate on today. When you hear, um, you should all take time to read uh, some of the story, because then you 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 get to see this amazing character of Prahlad Maharaj, who, who is his only, uh, he is only about compassion. That's all he's, he's only about compassion. He's only interested not only in the welfare of his father, he told Lord Nishingadev, he said, well, two plates better than one. He, <laughs> you want to see the prasadam? I, it, it can't compare with the prasadam and new Govardhan. It's like, I don't want to show it to you. I'll be embarrassed, but I will look at it. Yeah, it's not bad. Oh, we made your kofta balls. You're famous for kofta, right? But we don't have your kofta recipe. We have spinach, rice, and something. Yeah. So, um, this this character of Prahlad Maharaj was was manifested in one verse where he told Lord Nishingadev in his prayers. He said, he said, um, when I'm hearing and chanting your glories. I am magna chitta. My consciousness is absorbed in what? Bliss. Maha magna, maha mrita magna chitta. A great ocean of bliss I'm swimming in. That was the first two lines. And then he goes in the third line. He says, but I have anxiety. I'm distressed by the fact that other people aren't experiencing that. So his... You, you know, have you ever been in a situation where there's suffering in the world, but your situation is okay? So it's it's a little more difficult to be compassionate when you yourself are not suffering. Generally, people who have suffered more tend to be more compassionate towards others who are suffering. Poorer people tend to be com more concerned about people who are poor. Homeless people tend to be concerned more about homeless people than people who are wealthy. Have, have you noticed that? Are you aware of that? Yeah, it happens that way. So Prahlad Mars is the opposite. He's saying, okay, I'm satisfied, but it's all these other people that I want liberated. And what Lord Nishingadev did, you see, he, he blessed Prahlad in the sense that if you hear the story about Prahlad, then whoever hears about it will be liberated. And that was Prahlad's desire. But so how do you liberate, liberate everybody? And so the Acharya said, you can't really liberate people you don't know. It's like, you can't pray for people, you have to know them. You can't, I pray for everyone in the world. No, no, it doesn't work. You need to know them. So it was actually impossible for him to pray and, um, or at least liberate everybody. He could pray, but he doesn't know everybody. So Lord Nishingadev to fulfill his desire arranged that we would do, he would do this Leela with Lord Nishingadev and then whoever heard the Leela would be liberated. And that way fulfilled Prahlad's desire. So. So that's Prahlad's heart. Nothing, nothing can change that, no matter how he's treated. And so this is a lesson for us. It's a lesson in living in integrity. Who are you? And can you be thrown off your game so easily because someone comes up to you and says, I don't like you? And immediately you become angry, where, where you value being peaceful and kind and compassionate and someone says something? you don't like and you become angry and you completely you completely fall out of character. Do we do that? Yeah, we do that more than we'd like to. And if we even do it once, that's one time too many. Prahlad Maharaj was fixed, fixed in who, uh, fixed as a liberated soul. And therefore, no matter how he was treated, he was compassionate and he prayed to, to Lord Nishingadev. Lord Shingadev said, 
what do you want? And he said, I don't want anything. I don't want to ask you for anything. I'm, I'm your servant. Servant doesn't ask the master. The, I just want to serve you. I love you. You're like my father. I just want to give you. No, no, ask something. So now you have this battle between them. Take something. No, I don't want to take anything. No, please take something I want to give you. No, I'm not a businessman. I don't want to do something, say something nice, so you'll give me something. Lord, Lord Nishingadev said, no, please ask, please ask. And he said, okay, I will ask that you liberate my father. So it's, it's, it's again, he's, it's totally in character with who he is, the compassion that he has. When Lord Nishingadev says, take anything you want, God comes to you and says, take anything you want, and your father tried to kill you and you say, liberate him. That's interesting to put it lightly, isn't it? <clears throat> it shows the heart of Prahlad Maharaj. And so for us as members of the Hare Krishna movement, Prahlad Maharaj is a real icon because when we go out to share Krishna consciousness, not everyone appreciates it. In fact, in, I think it was maybe 1969, there was a bomb was blown up in the Los Angeles temple. And that's when Prabhupada asked us to chant the prayers of Nishringadev. But Prabhupada said, because we're spreading God consciousness, there are going to be people who don't like it and, that, and they, will, they will attack us. But Prabhupada never said, we should attack them back. It was always one time, uh, they got a temple in a very bad neighborhood. It was like one of the, the, the highest, this city had the highest crime rate in all the cities in the United States. And this neighborhood had the highest crime rate in the city. So do the math. And that's where the temple was. Well, that's where they were thinking of getting the temple. Like, why did they think of getting a temple? That was the Fisher Mansion. It was a mansion that was practically being given away for nothing because it was in the neighborhood that had degraded so much, nobody would buy it. So we got a building. I don't know that building must be worth, who knows now, $15 million now. And we got it for 300,000 in 1975. Of course, with inflation, it's a little more, but still, it was still quite inexpensive. And they said, Prabhupada, we don't know if we should buy this building. I think it was an escrow and they could pull out. He said, we don't know if we should buy it because It's a dangerous neighborhood. He said, no, invite them all in. Let them come in. Give them prasadam and tell them you can steal whatever you want. You can steal it. <laughs> <laughs> so that was proper. Yeah, that's okay, whatever. All right. So in the interest of time, we are now going to give Nicholas, who's soon to be, well, let me give you a hint, Nicholas. Today is Nishinga Chatur Dasi, and your name begins with an N. So there, there might be some connection there. But um, I will give you your name after you tell me how many rounds you're going to chant and principles you're going to follow and what else you're going to do. And then do you have the beads I gave you? Are they around? Yes. Because, because when um, I will give them, I will pretend to be giving them through the screen and then you can receive them if you have them. Okay, so um, so how many rounds are you gonna chant? Don't take the beads yet. To, um, just when I put my hand up to the to the camera, you can take them. So how many rounds are you gonna chant? And at least 16 rounds in my mantra. Yeah, are they gonna be good or bad? Good is it. <laughs> because if they're not good, don't bother to chant them. <laughs> There's not really a need to chant bad rounds. You know, it's like counterfeit money. You don't need it. Just burn it. Yeah. Okay, I, that's being extreme. But we're, you're making a vow to chant 16 good rounds, not just get them done. Okay, and what are the four principles you're going to follow? No meat eating, no intoxication, no gambling, and all this is sex. Okay, so now... I'm going to go like this, and you're going to put the beads in your hand, okay? And then I'll give you your name. So you're going to, you have the beads there? Yeah, okay. So take the beads. I'm handing, put the beads in his hand. 
Your name is Nishringa Chaitanya Dasa. Nishringa Chaitanya Dasa Kijai. Now, you know, Lord Chaitanya, sometimes he became very angry and it was said he was angry like Lord Nishringa did. You know, it was the anger in... Sometimes he becomes angry to protect his devotees, angry at those who offend his devotees, he becomes angry. So that that is one aspect of Nishinga Chaitanya, when Lord Chaitanya becomes angry. But uh, it's okay to become angry if you become angry for beneficent, for uh, beneficial reasons, to protect people, yeah. To correct and protect, you may, it may be beneficial to be angry. But there's another aspect um, that when you place Nishingadev on an altar where there's Lord Chaitanya, then he will take on Lord Chaitanya's mood. So we can we can also say this is you can say it's Lord Chaitanya in Nishingadev's mood, or you can say it's Nishingadev in Lord Chaitanya's mood. <laughs> it's probably better for you to think like that, right? <laughs> now I have a little story for you, and this has never happened in any initiation, and somehow it's happening today. So, where did this name come from? Well, I had a god brother named Nishinga Chaitana, and I know probably no one's ever heard that name before. And we worked together, and, and we were in San Diego, California. And he later moved to Florida, and we spent some time, but I lost touch with him. And recently he left his body. And um, I had written a book called Living the Wisdom of Bhakti. And the devotee who was taking care of him had helped me edit that book. And he was going through a really dark night of the soul. He had gone through some hard times in his spiritual life and he was having all kinds of doubts, even up to the end of his life. And she said, um, that book really helped him. And you know, she, she, she said, I, I got his watch and I wanna give you his watch. And here's his watch, it's a, is this a good watch? It's a, I don't know what it is. It's a something. Okay, I can't read it. Can you read it? You know anything about watches? What kind of is it? What does it say? A Reiko or something? It's what's written on there. Oh, oh, a Brexo. A Brexo. Maybe it's a, I don't know. Anyway, this is his watch. When I come to New Govardhan, I'm going to give you his watch. So you can wear the watch of the Prabhupada disciple, Nishringa Chaitanya, and you can remember him. And you've got the name Prabhupada gave to him. So, but you'll have to remind me when I'm coming to, you don't have to remind me to get on the plane to New Govardhan, you just have to remind me to take this with me. And it's sitting in my desk right here. And you're going to get this. Shrinka Chaitanya Prabhu Ki Jai. Sisirata Giridhari Ki Jai. Kaya Gaur Premanandi. So, um, continue your service. In, um, you, can, you can protect people from themselves in the, in the mode of Lord Nishingadev, because that's what he does. He purifies. And you can be in the mode of Lord Chaitanya as compassion to go out and do that service. Hare Krishna. To the Prabhupada ki So I have another class in 20 minutes. We're going to China in 20 minutes. It is um, 7 a.m. in China now. Well, it's 6.40 a.m. in China. So we're going to have to say goodbye to all of you. It was nice seeing you. Nice being with you. Hare Krishna. And I'm very happy that you're progressing nicely in spiritual life and doing such nice service in Australia, uh, keeping all the devotees happy by cooking for them and helping others um, from Krishna village relate to the temple and also teaching people how to chant. Thank you all for coming. <clears throat> Hare Krishna to everyone. Hare Krishna. And uh, Nishinga Chaitanya Ki Jai. <laughs> Jai. I guess I guess if you're wondering if you want to get a tattoo, I guess that answers that question. What kind of tattoo? <laughs> <you get? laughs>
Hare Krishna. You know, people ask me, like, can I get a tattoo? I'm like, well, if it helps you remember Krishna. I have many, you know, I was thinking, just get it, get the whole Nishinga Kabacha tattooed somewhere in your body and just like read, you know, read it every day. But anyway, that would be kind of extreme, wouldn't it? Okay, Srila Prabhupada Ki Jay, I'm going to leave you all for now. And we will see you next time. Hari Hari Bo.